Welcome. Today we are going to see about fibroid uterus. This is a very important topic regarding the exam point of view as well as clinically. Fibroid, it is also called as fibromyoma, leomyoma or myoma. So any of these terminologies used anywhere, please don't get confused. The question means that they are asking about a fibroid. It is a benign neoplasm of muscular wall of the uterus and it is composed of smooth muscle cells. They are most commonly solid pelvic tumors. They are the most common solid pelvic tumors of reproductive age group. Usually they are found in between 35 to 45 years of age. Frequently seen in nulliparous patient and women with low parity. They are estrogen dependent tumor. This is again an important point that this is estrogen dependent. It grows whenever there is excessive estrogen. It is associated with women with hyperestrogenism. So you can always guess that what are the clinical conditions likely to be associated with fibroid are endometrial hyperplasia, metropathica bleeding, CA endometrium. So whenever these estrogens are available in excess and continuously or unopposed, they will lead to all these group of hyperestrogenic conditions. Etiology of fibroid, it is unknown. But there are many things which are thought of. Each individual myoma is unicellular in origin. And estrogen, it is not a causative factor as such, but it always enhances or implicated in growth of myomas. Myomas contain estrogen receptors more than the other myometrial tissue around. Myoma also increase in size with estrogen therapy and in pregnancy as well as it decreases after menopause. So that tells us or confirms that it is an estrogen dependent tumor. They are very less likely possible before puberty. They are never detected before puberty rather. What is the effect of progesterone on myoma? The effect is unpredictable. Maybe stimulating or maybe inhibitory. Trials suggest that exogenous progesterone limits the growth, but surely antiprogesterone, that is RU486, causes atrophy of the fibroid. There is genetic predisposition to the fibroids. They are derived from single progenitor myocyte. 40 to 50 percent of leomyomas show identifiable karyotypic defects and more commonly chromosome involved are 6, 7, 12 and 14 and less commonly X, 1, 3, 10 and 13. Most commonly what is found is there is translocation between long arms of chromosome 12 and 14 and there is deletion of long arm of Y chromosome. Now depending on the estrogenic condition like early menarche the, the size is increased the reason is there is increased estrogen exposure. Elevated BMI, again increased estrogen, increased conversion of all the androgen to estrogen that leads to increased size of the fibroid. If family members are affected, chances are more. There is genetic differences in hormone metabolism. PCOS, unopposed estrogen secondary to anovulation increases the chance. Postmenopausal, the size also decreases because there is hypoestrogenism. Increased parity, estrogen and remodeling during involution, so it decreases size. Ocipils, either they decrease or there is no effect as such because exposure to estrogen is opposed by progesterone. But ocipils are not recommended as a treatment for fibroid pill. Smoking, smoking gives a protective effect on fibroid, they decrease the fibroids because decreased estrogen levels. They are frequently multiple. They may reach the size of 15 cm or even larger. Firm in consistency, spherical or irregularly lobulated. They have a false capsule and they can be easily nucleated from that false capsule from the surrounding myometrium. That capsule separates this fibroid from the surrounding myometrium. Round, pearly white, firm, rubbery tumor and on cut surface it shows world pattern. This world pattern, this world you have to remember that it shows world pattern on cut surface. They have a thin outer connective tissue layer and this cleavage plane allows leoma to be shelled out when we, whenever we are doing myomectomy. 
Mitotic activity is rarely seen. Blood supply to the fibroid is always from periphery to center. Remember this thing that the blood vessel runs from periphery towards the center of the fibroid. So at periphery, at the capsule, there is maximum blood supply and at the center of the fibroid, the blood supply is less. One to two major vessels are found at the base or at the pedicle of the fibroid. Now coming to the classification. As you can see this, this is the uterine cavity, myometrium and depending on this position where the fibroid is located, we can divide the types. Usually all of them, they start here, intramural or also called as interstitial. And then gradually, depending on the growth, if they come out, like they are moving towards the serosa, they become subserous. And if they start moving towards the cavity, the mucus lining, they become submucus. They can be pedunculated submucus fibroid, pedunculated subserous fibroid. This fibroid may get detached and become a wandering fibroid. Cervical fibroid which is found in the cervical region. The growth may be towards broad ligament and this becomes broad ligament fibroid. Or a fibroid can have a polyp. It becomes a polyp and comes out of the external os and becomes a fibroid polyp. So these are common varieties. The cervical polyp is also described as very classically as the lantern on dome of St. Paul. Means the fibroid is here and the uterus is kind of kept on the fibroid. So it's typically described as lantern on dome of St. Paul, the church and the bale. These fibroids, they are likely to have certain changes as per, as the age advances, age of the fibroid as well as age of the patient. They can either go these uh, benign degeneration changes or there can be malignant transformation. What are these benign changes? Atrophy, rate degeneration, Hyaline degeneration, cystic, calcification or myxomatous. Atrophy as it grows on. Rate de degeneration we will see in details. Most common benign degeneration is hyaline degeneration. It becomes yellow, there is soft gelatinous areas found in the fibroid. Cystic, there is liquefaction, follows extreme hyalinization. Calcification, usually it is at the periphery from where the blood supply is. So remember, calcification is always outside and degeneration is inside. Calcification at periphery, there is circulatory deprivation and precipitation of calcium carbonate and phosphate. So usually this calcification, calcified areas are found at the periphery of the fibroid. Myxomatous fatty, it is uncommon. It follows hyaline or cystic degeneration. So we have seen the changes which are benign, which take place in the fibroid and many questions are asked on this. So please pay attention, atrophy, rate degeneration, hyaline change is the most common in which yellow soft gelatinous areas are formed, cystic degeneration where there is liquefaction which follows hyalinization, calcification which is at periphery and myxomatous change which is rare. Now let's see rare degeneration in details. Mind well that this is the topic where maximum questions are asked on fibroid. So please remember each and every word of this degeneration. Rare degeneration is carneous degeneration, the other name. So MCQ might be asked in this way that carneous degeneration and you will get confused that which degeneration they are talking about. So please remember it is the same that is rare degeneration. It occurs during pregnancy and very rarely seen in non-pregnant females. Even in pregnancy, it is seen in mid trimester, either second or third trimester. There is usually edema and hypertrophy. There is venous thrombosis, which impaired the blood supply. So the supplying blood vessel, there is thrombus formation. So blood supply is getting impaired. And there is aseptic degeneration and infarction with hemorrhage. So thrombosis, blood supply occluded, edema, hypertrophy, degeneration and infarction. All this together leads to red degeneration. It is a painful condition, but fortunately it is self-limiting. Signs and symptoms will be patient is pregnant with a fibroid and she will present with acute abdomen. 
So if you have differential diagnosis of pregnancy with acute abdomen after ectopic, remember fibroid degeneration that is rate degeneration. She may also have vomitings, malaise and slight fever. Lab will show leukocytosis and raised ESR. She may land up in preterm labor or rarely in DIC as well. Treatment is always conservative. Please watch my word, the treatment is conservative. There is no indication for surgical removal of fibroid if it undergoes rate degeneration. We have to conserve the uterus, the fibroid, everything. Treatment is bed rest, analgesics for the pain and rest to the patient. That's all. We don't have to do any surgery for re de red degeneration of the fibroid. Very rarely, we can also see malignant transformation in the fibroid. And this transformation, it occurs to leomyosarcoma. So it's the worst kind of prognosis of uh, this malignancy, which occurs in 0.1 to 0.5%. Remember the percentage, it is very rare, but it has bad prognosis. Most common fibroid which has this change is either submucous or intramural. So our MCQ can be there. Fibroids undergoing sarcomatous change, which are more likely interstitial that is intramural or submucous fibroid. This change begins at the center. When we were talking about calcification, I told you that calcification starts at periphery. When we are talking about sarcomatous change, it starts at the center. Usually it is seen in postmenopausal. Rare degeneration was seen in pregnancy. Sarcomatous change is seen in postmenopausal women with fibroid, long-standing fibroids. Again, this is a condition where fibroid becomes painful. Otherwise, fibroids are not painful as such. Rate degeneration and now I'm talking about sarcomatous change where fibroids become painful, tender, they grow rapidly and there can be pyrexia. These were the changes which take place in fibroid on long standing basis. Now let's see how fibroid present. What is the symptomatology? They are symptomatic only in 35 to 50 percent of the patient. So they may remain asymptomatic for a longer period of time. They just are there and they are growing in size but they are not causing any symptoms. And if they start causing symptoms, then the symptoms, they depend on the location of the fibroid, on the size of the fibroid, and what changes they are undergoing. And if related, the symptoms may be related with pregnancy. Now, what is the most common symptom? Abnormal uterine bleeding is the most common symptom of fibroid, usually seen in 30 to 40% of the patient. What would happen to the menstrual cycle? Usually, there are heavy and prolonged bleeding. It's called as progressive menorrhagia. Means, over a period of time, if that female used to bleed for maybe four days and changing three to four pads per day, now she may bleed for six days or eight days. So, the duration of bleeding can increase or she is bleeding for four days only, but now she has to change maybe five or six or eight pads. That means the quantity of the blood she is losing every day may increase. So somehow the blood loss has increased and it goes on increasing over a period of time. So heavy and prolonged bleeding, progressive menorrhagia, which leads to iron deficiency anemia because this is a chronic thing and patient goes on losing blood every cycle. Which are the fibroids which will present with this? Can you guess? The one interstitial or the submucous variety. Reason? There is increased surface area and increased vascularity. As these fibroids, they will increase the surface area of the endometrium and naturally they are going to cause these symptoms. The other menstrual change can be polymenorrhea. Bleeding is due to interruption of blood supply to the endometrium. There can be distortion and conge congestion of surrounding vessels or ulceration of the overlying endometrium and they, that may cause bleeding. So polymenorrhea. Metrorrhagia means irregular or intermenstrual bleeding. So this symptom would be seen in pedunculated submucous fibroid. There are areas of venous thrombosis and necrosis on the surface which will lead to intermenstrual bleeding. So if you see these fibroids will lead to excessive blood loss. This fibroid will lead to if the area gets necrosed there can be intermenstrual bleeding 
and polymenorrhea can also be seen because of interruption of the blood supply. Pain, this is the other symptom, but it is typical of certain conditions. If there is vac vascular occlusion leading to necrosis and infection, then there is pain. Or if there is torsion, if this pedunculated fibroid, there is torsion that will lead to acute pain. Myometrial contraction to expel the myoma. Any myoma, uterus is contracting to expel it out. That will also lead to pain. Rate degeneration, acute pain. Heaviness and fullness in the pelvic area. Feeling of a mass. These are few symptoms which the patient explains. If the tumor gets impacted in the pelvis and there is pressure on the nerves, that can also lead to backache or pain in lower extremities. Dyspareunia is, in, is seen very rarely, but it is seen in the fibroid which is protruding in vagina. But remember, pain in fibroid is either because of torsion of the pedunculated fibroid, rate degeneration or sarcomatous change which is seen. Pressure effects, if they are large and they distort or compress the organs like ureters, bladder, rectum, there would be urinary symptoms, hydroureter, constipation, pelvic venous congestion, even lower limb edema can also be seen. Rarely a posterior fundal fibroid, it causes extreme retroflexion of the uterus and that stretches the bladder. Uterus is going posteriorly, so the bladder base is getting stretched and because of that there would be urinary retention. Anterior cervical fibroid. A cervical fibroid if it is anteriorly, that will continuously irritate the bladder and lead to frequency of micturition. If the fibroid is posteriorly, that may cause stretching of the bladder and thus urinary retention or it will press on the rectum and will lead to constipation. Parasitic tumor, they may cause bowel obstruction. Means this one gets detached from the uterine cavity, finds some vessel somewhere, getting blood supply from that, growing. It's a parasitic fibroid now. So they may cause compression effect and bowel obstruction. Cervical fibroids, they also cause serosanguinous vaginal discharge, bleeding, dyspareunia or infertility. Now coming to pregnancy effect like infertility. Fibroid may have infertility as a symptom. The relationship is uncertain but 27 to 40% of women with multiple fibroids are infertile. But there can be presence of other causes of infertility like PID, endometriosis or an ovulatory cycle. Again, estrogen, increased estrogen, conditions related with that. So PCOS, anovulatory cycles, endometriosis can be associated with this. So we cannot just blame the fibroid for that infertility. Usually the fibroids which are in the cavity, they are the ones which will have effect on fertility. Because these, if these fibroids are there, the density of formation would be defective and there would be defective implantation. Sometimes if fibroid can have this cornual block, this fibroid grows and this blocks the cornu. So then infertility can be caused. But the cause of infertility, which fibroid is more common? Submucous variety. Remember, submucous variety is the most common cause of infertility in fibroid. It may also cause spontaneous abortions. Incidence of myomectomy has shown that after myomectomy, the incidence of abortion has gone down. So retrospectively, we can say that they cause abortion. Again, which tumors, which fibroids will cause abortion? Yes, the ones which are present towards the cavity. So we have seen the, two, the fibroids which are present towards the cavity, they will lead to menorrhagia, that means excessive bleeding. They will also lead to infertility because of defective decidua and defective nidation and thus leading to defective implantation. And they will also lead to abortions because of the same reasons. So submucous variety is very important clinically. Now what are the findings on examination? You usually find a lump in abdomen. Most myomas are discovered when a bimanual examination is done. A pelvic examination. We find a hard mass, mobile and we suspect 
there is a fibroid. Enlarged uterus with regular bossy appearance and cervix moves with the lump means when we are doing the examination and we push the lump up, two fingers which are placed near the cervix, which are feeling the cervix, this hand per abdominally, I'm pushing the lump up and cervix loses the touch of my fingers means the cervix moves up with the mass. So that suggests the mass is arising from the uterus and it is more likely a fibroid. We can also feel mass in the fornix in case of broad ligament. You can feel if I am doing PD examination, I am going to feel this mass in the fornix. That's a broad ligament fibroid or a cervical fibroid or submucous polyp can be seen outside the os on PS that is per speculum examination. Laboratory findings. Usually these patients are anemic because they are losing blood every cycle. There is depletion of iron reserve. Rarely there is erythrocytosis seen because of pressure on the ureters, back pressure on the kidneys and there is more erythropoietin secretion and that induces erythrocytosis. Acute degeneration and infection of the fibroid can lead to increased ESR, leukocytosis and fever. Now which are the good radiological investigation which will tell us about fibroid? In the practice, ultrasound is the best investigation, transabdominal or transvaginal. They give us information about the number of the fibroid, the size, location. Most of the times, TVS is much better than TS in telling these informations to us. They confirm the diagnosis, they exclude pregnancy, especially in obese patient. But there are other modes of investigations as well and each has its own specification. Saline histosonography or sonosalpingography, they can give us information more about the submucous myoma, where exactly it is arising from, what's the size. HSG, that is histosalpingography, can also tell us about intrauterine leomyoma. You are putting a dye and getting an x-ray dye and this will appear as a space occupying lesion. MRI, it's costly but it's highly accurate in delineating the size, location and number of myomas. But it is not always necessary in the clinical practice. Patients can't afford it. IVP will show any pressure symptoms or pressure changes because of fibroid like ureteral dilatation or deviation and urinary anomalies. Hysteroscopy, putting the scope inside and you are seeing the cavity and these kind of fibroids that can be diagnosed and therapeutically treated through hysteroscope. So remember that the best investigation is MRI because it gives maximum accurate information but which is clinically not advisable to each and every patient. So then the second choice which is clinically feasible remains ultrasound. In ultrasound, TVS is much better because it gives better information than transabdominal scan. Differential diagnosis. First differential diagnosis of fibroid, you should always think this is a tumor which is present in the reproductive age group. And in reproductive age group, if there is a tumor, think of pregnancy first. Rule out pregnancy and then move ahead. Because if you miss on pregnancy, then there is nothing foolish or more foolish than that. So pregnancy is the first differential diagnosis. And other pelvic masses, hematometra, any ovarian tumor, tubo ovarian abscess, endometrioma or endometrial cyst, adenomyosis, myometrial hypertrophy or congenital anomalies of the uterus like bicornuate uterus one horn you are feeling as a mass, see endometrium because again hyperestrogenic condition and maybe ectopic pregnancy. It's a big topic so let's stop here and we'll see the management in next session. Thank you.